thank you, Lisa. Appreciate that very much. That uh, certainly does add to services. You know, this time of year is a time that we do spend a little extra time on thankfulness and being thankful. Appreciate the, this message this morning, the first message. Um, it ties right in. Um, again, he and I didn't talk about what we're going to speak about. And although at the beginning of this, you might not understand or you might not pick up on the idea of being thankful, but I think, I hope, by the time I'm done, that'll be a very clear message. Um, because the title of my sermon today is, Are We Being Sifted? You think, how does that tie into being thankful? Well, when we think about troubles and trials that we all face and we all go through, and we all do face these on a daily basis, think about God and God in nature even, and how He uses um, different things in nature to show us how troubles and trials actually make us a better person. I want to start by sharing with you a little story here. You probably all have heard this before, but I want to go over it again. It's, it's very interesting. It says, One day a small gap appeared in a cocoon through which the butterfly had to appear. A boy who accidentally passed by stopped and watched how the butterfly was trying to get out of the cocoon, was struggling. It took a lot of time. The butterfly was trying very, very hard, and the gap was as little as it was when he started. It seemed that the power that the butterfly used would soon leave the butterfly. The boy decided to help the butterfly. He took a penknife and he cut the cocoon. The butterfly immediately got out, but its body was weak and feeble, and the wings were barely moving. The boy continued to watch the butterfly, thinking that now its wings would spread and it would fly. However, that did not happen. The rest of its life, the butterfly had to drag its weak body and wings that weren't spread. It was unable to fly because the boy did not realize that through an effort, troubles and trials, to enter through a narrow gap of the cocoon, that was necessary for the butterfly so that that would give the life-giving fluid from the butterfly's body to its wings so it could fly. Life forced the butterfly to leave its shell hardly so that it would become stronger and then would be able to grow and develop. If we were allowed to live without meeting difficulties, we would not be viable. Life gives us challenges to make us stronger. I've read that story several times, and probably you have too. It says a lot about the plan God has for us, even, yes, in our trials and our difficulties. You know, God's Word, God's prophecies, they're, they're loaded through the fact that His people in all generations, not just in the past and not just us now and whoever comes in the future, all generations, guess what? Well, they will have to suffer trials and afflictions. As Paul told the brethren soon after he had been stoned, he says, we must, through many tribulations, what? Enter the kingdom of God. He didn't say, we can just walk right in. He says, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. That's Acts 14. Also, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, talks about this. Hebrews 12.5 talks about this. And then finally, Psalms 34, verse 19. They all talk about this topic. These scriptures, they're, they're very appropriate, but you know what? When we read them, they seem to carry a lot more weight when you and I are in the middle of a trouble or a trial. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Paul, he talked here in Romans 5, verse 3 and 4. He says this, that we also glory in tribulations. And this is why, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. You see the, the ladder that he put in front of us? So this is it. We have to glory in tribulations because if we go through our tribulations and we take them and we have success in them, this is what happens. 
You know, we must come to understand that it is our trials, brother, our trials, helps us to grow in patience. And patience is extremely necessary in our spiritual life. You know, as humans, you know, we, we don't like to wait. <laughs> we don't want to wait on things. We don't really have a lot of patience. You know, there's some that do, but a lot of us don't. Notice what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse 6 and 7. Peter wrote this, and starting in verse 6 and 7, 1 Peter 1, verse 6 and 7, said, In this salvation you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Trials are a very necessary part of a Christian's life. But here's the thing. Satan will absolutely do everything he can to take those trials and turn up the fire, so to speak, and take it to the next level. Yes, he will try to destroy us. Satan, his attempts is to destroy you and I, and it's destroyed God's people, destroyed God's church. That is what he wants to do. He's been trying to do this all along, just as he did here in Peter's day, by sifting Peter. He does the same thing in our day. But there's a, there's a key element here. When he asks to sift Peter, which we'll get to in just a second, well, you might go ahead and turn there to Luke chapter 22. He asks to sift Peter. But Jesus Christ, guess what? Limited Satan's grasp. And he does that for us too, not just Peter. Look at Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 28. He says, but you, and, and listen to what... Uh, Christ is doing here, how he's setting this up. He says, But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed upon one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now we stop there for just for a minute to understand that Christ here is talking to the disciples. He's talking to you and I as well. And what he's doing here, he's saying, you know, but you are those who kept the faith. That's what he says, you have continued with me through my trials. You are the ones who didn't turn your back. You are the ones who saw it all, and you still followed. Oh, you came back. <laughs> You're with me. And then he said, because of that, I offer you now the kingdom, the kingdom of God. The one, the very one that my father, he's saying here, bestowed upon me. And then this is what you, the reward you'll get, that you may eat at my table, you may drink at my table, and set it in my, uh, at my kingdom, set at my thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He's telling them, these are the rewards for your faithfulness. But then look at verse 31. This is where we kind of see the tides turn just a little bit. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you. Why? That he might sift you. Okay, it doesn't stop there. That he might sift you as wheat. That's a little different. What we see here is he, Satan, is asking for Simon Peter by name. Do you not think that Satan also asked for each and every one of us by name? And he don't just want to sift us. He wants to sift us as wheat. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But what about sifting? What is sifting? Well, the, the standard definition for sifting is to put flour, that we're all familiar with, through a, a sieve or some kind of other straining device 
And we do this in order to separate the fine from the coarse particles. That's one definition. Another one is to apply by scratching with or as with a sieve, okay, or scattering. And then the final one here is to examine and to sort carefully. So that's the modern definition of sifting, being sifted. You know, I'm sure, I, and I can remember, and probably most of you can too, that when I was a, a, a teenager, I remember my, my mom, she had one of these old sifters. You know, they were the little can-style sifter. had a handle on it and a crank on the side and had a, a, a wire inside. And you would crank that thing, and a wire would go and hit a screen on the bottom of it. And when you had the flower in there, the faster you cranked it, it would just flower would just come through that. But it was fine, really fine particles of flour. And when it was finished, anything that wasn't pushed through the sifter, it would be on top. It would be left to dispose of. And I remember that. You know, flour wasn't as fine in those days as it is now, so it always needed to be sifted. But the process of sifting here that Christ was warning Peter about, he says, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. Well, that was a little different. It was much, much more intense. You could almost say this was a violent process. This here was an action that was used to separate the grain from the stalk and the, the chaff using a threshing machine, very much like we see a combine in the fields today. It tore the wheat apart. It didn't just gently press it. It tore it. It ripped it apart. And it would separate the valuable portions from the worthless portions. As a Christian, you and I, as children of God, our lives are placed through a sifter every day. And with each new day, that crank is turned. And it's turned a little bit faster and a little bit faster. And what it does, it takes our rough edges. At least that's how it should be. It takes our rough edges off. It helps the rough edges to disappear. And it helps the finer parts of our spirituality, of the new man, if you will, come forward. The coarse parts of our sinful life are left on top and then dumped out. That's how the sifting should work. But on the other hand... Satan here, when he goes to Christ and he asks for you and I by name that he can sift us, his desire is to totally destroy us. He don't want to separate the rough from the fine and keep the good and get rid of the bad. He wants to totally destroy us. He wants to sift us to the point that we are completely, number one, discouraged. Number two, distracted. Number three, lost our commitment. And finally, completely destroyed. That is his goal. The thing about him is, he is always, always standing before God the Father in heaven, pointing his fingers of accusation against all of us as children of God. He's reminding God of every simple thing that we have ever done. The beauty of it is, God says, once we ask for repentance, you're forgiven and he forgets. Satan comes back and brings it up again again. Look quickly at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. It says this, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of His Christ have come. And this is what he points out. Because the accuser of the brethren, Satan, who accuses them before God day and night, he never quits his, his fight to put a bad taste in God's mouth for you and me. That's what he tries to do all the time. But look at the last few words. Has been cast down. It's very, very true. When God says, if you repent, which repent means change, turn, go the other way. If you repent, ask for forgiveness of your sins, He will not only forgive them, but forget them. 
It's very helpful in talking about this to consider why Satan would focus his attention on you and I who, I mean, think about it. We were called the weak, the base, <laughs> you know. We're not really what the world desires to, to, to be. None of us, uh, or very few of us are, are elected officials. I don't see any President of the United States sitting in here. Well, the answer ties directly to the question. The question, why was he so anxious to have access to Peter? He asked for Peter by name. Now, all the disciples were there. He asked for Peter by name. Well, one of the reasons for this is because very clearly Satan was listening. He was listening to Jesus Christ when he made this statement in Matthew 16, and verse 18. Matthew 16, and verse 18. <clears throat> Satan was paying attention. Look what he said. Christ said, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, the grave, will not overcome it. You know what that means? <laughs> that right there was a message to Satan himself. The gates of of Hades, the grave. Nothing will overcome God's church. And that was a strong warning. And he, as he first said, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. He was establishing the New Testament church of God. Peter was a foundational part of this establishment. This is why Satan wanted to sift Peter. That's why he started with Peter. He wanted to break Peter, he wanted to destroy Peter, and he certainly wanted to destroy the church. Brethren, you and I are the church. The church is not a building. It's you and I. And guess what? He wants to destroy you and I as well. We don't have to let that happen. When Peter was sifted, and we'll look at the story here in a minute, when he was sifted, he failed. He failed pretty miserably. But here's the thing. It was not a lasting or it was not a permanent, a permanent kind of failure. After his denial, Luke tells us that he went out and wept bitterly. He repented. Now, this is a few verses later on in the story. And here's the thing. Just because someone fails, someone quits, Someone gives up, whatever. That doesn't make them a failure. We need to understand this. What does make a person a failure is their decision to give up. It's not when they quit. It's when they decide, I'm done. I'm really done. That's when they become a failure. Satan knows how to sift each and every one of us. He knows where... Uh, to pull our strings. He knows what, to, uh, what buttons to push. He knows how to poke us. He knows uh, what financial pressures that we might be under. He knows all this. He knows how to trigger our impatience. We talked a little bit about that. He knows how to get under our skin. He knows how to get us very, very frustrated. And he will do absolutely everything he can to make that happen. Because all he has to do is start just a little bit. And you know what? You and I, we're, we're so good at uh, picking a sore on us or picking sore on someone else that it becomes festered and infected. And then that member can be cut off. Satan knows that. And all he has to do is plant the seed. We have to be careful not to let that happen. We need to continue to pray, to pray for the time to come when Satan will be put away, be put out of our lives and draw closer to God, draw closer to Jesus Christ. But right now, we have to understand, we have to realize that Satan is still very much part of this world, and he is on the warpath, and he is making war against God's people. You know, Jesus, his warning to 
to Peter here. Um, and hey, listen, listen, Peter, pay attention. Satan has asked for you by name. That warning is the same to you and me today. Satan is trying to sift you and me. And he does this, again, not to make us better by any means, but to destroy us, to destroy all that we are so he can break our spirit, he can crush our hearts, he can destroy our families, and absolutely, brethren, he wants to break our faith. The thing is, the sifting process never stops. And it is very uncomfortable. The question is, what kind of sifting are we going through right now? Every one of us here, are go we're going through a different type of sifting. Let me just throw out a, a few questions here just for us to think about. Do we feel confused about seemingly unanswered prayers to seemingly unended hardships in our lives? Probably all of us could say to some degree, yes. Does it feel as though our heart is being ripped apart as our life is severely shaken by unwanted circumstances? Again, probably. Is sin defeating us to the point where we doubt whether God can or would want to use us anymore? See, it just goes deeper and deeper. Has loneliness or rejection tempted us to wonder if God has forgotten us? Or worse yet, has God rejected us too? You know, these are all questions that we can ask ourselves. To some form or some degree, they probably apply. But here's the thing, brethren. We have learned from Peter's life that the enemies only bothers sifting those who threaten his evil schemes to build and rule a kingdom. So, maybe in a, <laughs> a different way, that should make us feel good. <laughs> kind of like we said before, if we're not having any troubles or trials, that probably means Satan's not messing with us because he's already got us. The bottom line is that it's never pleasant to realize that there is still some impatience within us. Maybe to see that there are still some lumps of anger in there. Maybe they still exist. Or maybe that we might have uh, a bit of a weak faith. <laughs> These are questions that we have to ask ourselves. This is part of the self-evaluation. But here's the thing. We don't have to go through this alone. We have an advocate with God the Father. And that we'll see that. Go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. First John chapter 2 and verse 1 says this, My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. So he's telling us, pay attention here. This is what I'm telling you. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Who is it? Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation or the atonement for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. This should encourage each and every one of us, no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what trial we find ourselves in, to hold on to this promise and use it. Join me in Luke chapter 22 again. And notice what Christ said to Peter after he gave him this warning. Luke 22, verse 32. He said, But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But did you catch that? He said, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. We talked about failing. Failing is not having a bad day or slowing down. Failing is rejecting God. When we say, I'm done, I've had enough, that's failing. Christ here knew that 
this sifting would be so severe to Peter that he prayed for Peter not to reach that point in his spirituality. Don't go that deep. Yeah, you're going to have a bad day. <laughs> you're going to have a few bad days. But don't allow it to go that deep. He said, I prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And then look what he said here. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. That is a prayer of faith. Christ is not just any defense lawyer who stands to our defense. He holds, if you will, the title deed to our eternal life. We belong to Him. And here's the, here's the, the great news. Satan can't touch any of us without the permission of our owner. That is why Satan first asked Christ for Peter by name. He had to have permission to do what he was about to do. Same thing when he went to God on for Job. So, what has Jesus Christ done for us in order that he can stand in our defense? Well, we all know uh, the one word answer to that is the crucifixion. All of that, everything there that he went through. But we already mentioned one thing, and that was back in 1 John. I'm not going to turn there. But 1 John 2, verse 2, we just read it. He was our propitiation. Or in other words, He was our atonement, or He was our sin offering. So 1 John 2.2 2 says, Christ is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Well, let's look at just a few more of these that He not only did, but is still doing for you and I on a daily basis. Go, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians 1 verse 30. Here, we see four um, incredible uh, acts that he did right now. First Corinthians 1 verse 30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus. Now, here we go. We're, let's make this list. Who became for us, number one, wisdom from God. You know what that is? That's for you and I. That's knowledge of how you and I are supposed to live our life. And then continue on, he said, and righteousness. That is showing you and I how we can become holy, how we should be godly, or at least going on to perfection. And sanctification. You and I being set apart. We're not of the world. We are set apart from the world. And then finally, redemption. Giving you and I the full plan of salvation. That's just a few things. There, there's many, many more. Um, I'll just, just to list a few, 2 Timothy 4, 8, talks about He's become our righteous judge. Isaiah 53, 11, He becomes our righteous servant. Um, look at this last one. The faithful witness. I like that one. Uh, Revelation 1, verse 15. Well, I like them all, <laughs> but I appreciate what he says here. Faithful witness in Revelation 1, verse 5. Sent from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. Talks about the resurrection there. And the prince of the kings of the earth, the ultimate ruler, unto him that loves us and washes us from our sins in his own blood. Again, it goes back to what he did for us, what he and God the Father did for us. Brother, the thing is that we are so blessed to have Jesus Christ on our side in this battle that you and I fight on a daily basis to grow and to strengthen our salvation. The fact remains that even though Satan tries to sift us to the point of destruction, he can never accomplish his mission because Jesus Christ is our advocate to God the Father unless... That's like saying, but. That's that transition word. Unless you and I give up and we completely quit. Unless we fail. And that's what that means. The same command that Jesus gave to Peter stands for you and I. But the promises do too. So just kind of paraphrasing this story. 
What we see here in Luke 22 is Christ told Peter, he said, Peter, when you make it through the sifting, because if you read verse 32 and 33, remember he didn't say if you come through. He said, when you return, strengthen the brethren. So he said, you know, Christ told Peter, said, when you make it through the sifting, and Satan has done his worst, and he will, you are going to come out of this on top. Why? Because Christ prayed for him. He prayed for his faith. He prayed for Peter. He prayed for you and I. I'm not going to go there. I think I mentioned this two weeks ago. But go back to uh, John 17 and read the chapter. You see, he went to God for you and me. He goes on to say, your faith will be tested, you will be tried, and guess what? You'll even be found weak, and you're going to fail just a little bit. You're not going to fail completely, but you are going to stumble. He said, but at the end, you're going to make it through victoriously. He wanted to say, not because of your own power, your own ability, but because Jesus Christ makes intercession for you. And Satan can go no further than Christ will allow. And then he told Peter, go and strengthen your fellow disciples. And he told them this because many of them, they weren't quite as strong as Peter. And that's fine. All of us are on different spiritual levels. And that, that's not wrong. What is wrong is if we stop right there or we start falling from there. It's not wrong to be where we are, but we need to be growing. We need to be looking for the next level and the next level. And beyond that, we need to be striving for perfection. As long as we have a breath to take, <laughs> we have to be fighting for that. And that's what he's telling them. He said that their faith will be weak also. He said that they're going to run in fear. Run in fear. Denying their knowledge of Christ. He said that they're going to emerge from the events of his crucifixion, the death on the cross, with delusioned hearts. He's going to say there, he told them all about this. He told them what was going to happen. They didn't understand or they didn't believe. They're going to have doubts over the reality of him being Jesus Christ. And they're definitely going to have doubts over their own actions. But then he told Peter, he said, your name may mean rock, but your name doesn't matter. At that point, what matters is that you are founded upon the rock. Remember, that's what it said. Peter, your name's Peter. You are founded on the rock. Look at a couple of scriptures just to kind of strengthen that. Psalms 40. Verse 2. <clears throat> Psalms 40, verse 2. says, he brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. You see what we're doing here? We're, we're setting the foundation. Christ is putting the church on the right foundation. If we don't have a good foundation, it won't take much sifting from Satan to cause us to lose our footing, and we fall. Just another one is Zechariah 4, verse 6. It's very encouraging. I'll just read it to you. Zechariah 4, verse 6. It says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. You know, the thing is, brethren, neither Peter or any church member can overcome Satan on their own. But by the power of God, through, again, the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, we can and we will overcome but we can't let down. Our victory over the sifting process will become a great part of our example that we set in living a physical life here on earth. And everybody's watching. You know, it's not just church members, but the world's watching us, especially now in this age when things seem to be kind of crazy. They want to know what is this crazy church that meets on Saturday doing? that keeps the Old Testament holy days. What are, what are they doing? People's watching. You and I will be much stronger for having 
faced the process. And then we will be much more able to help our fellow brethren, our fellow servants, you know, to, as they continue to face the same sifting process. It's like he told Peter, strengthen your fellow brethren. That's what we have to do. It's the same command for us. In reading and understand this section of Scripture, it's important to realize that Peter did make mistakes. We want to be aware of what he did so you and I won't make the same mistakes. Let's go back to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Look at verse 33 and 34 here. <clears throat> Verse 33, But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Now, can you imagine that? If you and I were in that same situation, we had just finished having a Passover with Jesus Christ. We'd been walking with him for three plus years. We knew, and probably knew him better than we knew our physical family. And Christ looked at us and said, hey, I'm about to die. I'm about to face this horrible, horrible death. It's about to get real, as we say in today's language. Would we say what Peter said here? Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. We might. You know, we get caught up in the moment, and we know we want to be able to say that. But look what Christ said. Then he said, I tell you, Peter... The rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you even know me. Can you imagine the blow that must have been dealt to Peter? The fact of the matter is, Christ was being honest and sincere. Peter was a little disillusioned. Peter was already being sifted while Jesus was cautioning and encouraging him. Satan had already begun to work on Peter's heart. He'd begin to work on his mind, and he certainly began to work on his attitude. He'd already started. Peter's pride in his own spirituality and in his physical strength, guess what? That was his downfall. Satan had already caused pride and a stubborn attitude, a self-reliant attitude, to take root in Peter. Brethren, never forget that we have absolutely no power to fight Satan within ourselves. We are never going to be such a spiritual giant that we can overcome Satan on our own. It is only, and I say only, by God the Father and Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit that you and I will overcome and we will win any battle. But he says we can but we have to rely on them. And that's it. All of us are being sifted right now. And each of us, we have our own weak points. And they're all different. But the, the truth of the matter is, Satan knows what they are in each and every one of us. And that's the ones he'll attack. He's trying to break every one of us right now, even while we're sitting here in church, listening to God's Word. And we certainly don't have to let him win. That's a choice that we have to make. We don't have to let him win. We need to keep our faith in Jesus Christ and God the Father. And we need to continue, continue to grow our relationship with them every minute of every day. Christ gives us, the church, you and I, a warning. Here in Luke 22, we'll continue on. I'm going to back up and read part of verse 34 again and then continue on to 36. Then he said... I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. And he said to them, When I sent you without money bags, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, Nothing. No, they didn't lack anything. Then he said to them, But now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack. And he, was, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. 
Christ already knew that we're all them, you and I today, we're going to stumble and we're going to stub our toes and we're going to trip and we're going to fall. Um, over whatever test comes our way. He knows that. He already knows that you and I are not strong enough to resist this sifting process on our own. Otherwise, he would not have made a prayer for you and I. He did on more than one occasion. Jesus knew Peter was going to deny him. He knew Peter was going to fall. He knows you and I just as well as he knew Peter. But Jesus also knows that the Father in heaven will hear his prayers and he will not allow us to fall again unless we completely give up and we completely turn our backs on God. If we don't do that, he won't let us fall. And I can't stress that enough, brethren. Turn with me, if you will, back to John chapter 10. Verse 28 through 30. John 10, verse 28 through 30. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. The only way that can happen is if you and I quit. If we completely give up, we completely throw in the towel, and we say, it's not worth it. I'm done. The fact is, brethren, God will never fail us. He will bring us out victoriously if we continue to keep the faith. Think about this. Jesus Christ, through the allowing of God the Father, did not die on the cross. A horrible, horrible death to purchase our salvation and then allow Satan to steal our eternal life. But here's the thing. We absolutely must do our part. We have to stay close to the Father, stay close to Christ. Make our heart a heart after God's, just as David did. And God will see us through. Christ told his disciples to take their purse, their script, and go and buy a sword. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. You know, you can, we can reason all around this. We, we can look at this section of Scripture and we can say, yeah, well, during you know, the, the, the earthly ministry of Christ, the disciples, they had been carrying on the ministry in their own country among friends and, and fellows that they, they knew, um, among people that they knew. Even through dangerous and hard times, they still were there and they had Christ with them. But Christ told them to buy a sword because Christ wouldn't be with them. They were going to be on their own. And they were going to face strangers. They were going to face wild animals. They were going to face all difficulties. They had to provide for their family. They had to take up their sword to defend themselves. And we could probably go on and be happy with that explanation. Brother, all that's physical. That's physical. Think about it spiritually. <laughs> that's the point. Think about it spiritually. The symbolism of a sword here. Seems like Jesus Christ was telling you and I, not just them, but you and I, not to fight this battle against sin, against Satan, against the sifting of Satan with natural weapons and rebellion, but rather with the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. I won't go into all this. I'll skip down through it. But this was covered a while back. Ephesians 6, verse 11. It says, Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, physical, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, 
against spiritual forces of evil in this heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. There's the spiritual fight. We have to be able to stand to fight spiritually. And after you have done everything to stand. That means to have success in our spiritual fight. We have to stand to fight spiritually, and we have to do it so hard and so valiantly that when it's over, we will still be standing. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in your place, or in, in place, with your feet fitted with readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And then verse 17, what I want to come to. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But we should never attempt to fight this spiritual warfare or facing the sifting process without having a, a deep knowledge of the Word of God, as deep as we can possibly gain. And it needs to be in our hearts. It needs to be in our minds. And this, the only way you and I get this, is by studying and studying and studying and praying, asking God to reveal it to us, showing us these things, meditating on His Word, fasting more than just on atonement. Sometimes we might forget that we are fighting a spiritual warfare. When our troubles and sicknesses come, they are often linked in some fashion to this war that we are fighting. Brethren, we are going through the sifter. God allows Satan to do a certain amount of sifting. And he allows this to happen because it will help us to a certain degree, it'll help get the lumps out. God wants us to be able to be like gold tried in fire, like the clay molded by Him as the master potter. God wants us to keep the faith and He wants us to never stop. When the sifting process is pressing down hard on us and the grating away and our character is right there, and it's painful, and it seems that you and I, brother, we, can't, we just can't stand it any longer. Remember Romans 8, 28. You probably all know this by heart, and we'll take a quick look at it. Romans 8, 28. There's a certain word in here that I want to go into. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. A lot of times we stop right there. But it doesn't stop right there. To them who are called according to His purpose. Not called according to what you and I think, or you and I's purpose, or what you and I believe, but who are called according to His purpose. Our calling is a gift from God. He sacrificed a lot for you and I to have this. A lot of times, we should never throw this gift away and definitely don't make light of it. Go to Second Peter chapter 1. It kind of goes off of this. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. Peter here kind of added to what Paul was saying when he said this in verse 10. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. You notice what he said there? He said, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. He didn't say, step back and let Jesus Christ and God the Father do all the work. Let them do the work for you. They gave you the calling. Let them make sure that nothing happens. He says, give diligence to make your election, or your calling election sure. And he goes on to say, for if you do these things, you shall never fall. Now, he's talking about you'll never fall completely, lose faith, or lose hope, lose your eternal life. He knows you're going to stumble. I'm going to stumble. We're going to stumble. We're going to stub our toes. 
But he says, if you do these things, you'll come out on top. He says, if you do these things, you'll do exactly, and this is Peter talking, he says, you'll do exactly what Christ told me right after the Passover. He said, you're going to be sifted. It's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. But I've prayed for you, and you will survive. You won't just survive. You will come through victoriously. And then you can teach the rest of them. That's what he's saying here. If you do these things, you shall never fall. You'll never lose faith. He's going to say, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's another promise that if we keep the faith, the kingdom awaits. There is the great promise, brother. There is the hope. Remember, we talked about the, the building the ladder, perseverance ends in hope. It says we shall win. The thing is, if we don't quit, we don't give up, we don't fail physically, we have eternal life waiting on us. What a, a better hope does anybody have? Just think about this. God has established our way and He designed an eternal life for you and I with Him, Jesus Christ, and all the other saints in the kingdom. Just think about that. If you ever need something to meditate on, meditate on that. That is His hope for us. You know, we talk about our hope. What's my hope? Well, that's my hope, yes, but that's also God's hope. God's hope for you and I to be there. He, his hope is for all mankind to be there. One day soon, brethren, the sifting process will end. And Satan will have done his worst to each and every one of us. It's happening. But our advocate, Jesus Christ, who is our eldest brother, he will help all of us along the way to give us every opportunity, every bit of inspiration that you and I need to win this spiritual battle. If, and there's that big word again, if we remain faithful and committed, not just today or tomorrow, but to the very end. And if we do this, you know what? We have absolutely nothing to fear. The kingdom of God awaits. What a, what a better picture can we have. Yes, Satan is sifting us now, but he will be utterly crushed, and he will be cast into outer darkness. That's his fate. Does not, absolutely does not, have to be our fate. When it seems that you and I, we've been hit and tried and sifted and we can't go another mile, maybe not another step, that all of our efforts for the work of Christ are in vain and that we are going down the last time when all this seems to happen, and it does. Remember this last scripture. Go to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, look at verse 28. It says, when these things begin to happen, so he's got our attention, when these things begin to happen in our life, he's talking to us personally, he says, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. What a great promise. What encouragement, what hope. I want to finish, as I started with a story, I want to finish with a story. And you may have heard this one as well, but it talks again to what we've talked about today. And it's called the teacup. There's a story of a couple who went to England to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. They both liked antiques and pottery, especially teacups. Spotting an ex uh, exceptional cup in one shop, they asked, May we see that? We've never seen a cup quite so beautiful. As the lady handed it to them, suddenly the teacup spoke. You don't understand, it said. I've not always been a teacup. There was a time when I was just a lump of red clay. My master 
took me and he rolled me. He pounded and patted me over and over. And I yelled out, don't do that. I don't like that. Let me alone. But he only smiled and he gently said, not yet. Then wham, I was placed on a spinning wheel. And suddenly I was spun around and around and around. Stop it. I'm getting dizzy. I'm going to be sick, I screamed. But the master only nodded and said quietly, not yet. He spun me and he poked me and he prodded and bent me out of shape to suit himself. And then he put me in an oven. I've never felt such heat. I yelled and I knocked and I pounded at the door. Help, get me out of here. I could see him through the opening and I could read his lips as he shook his head from side to side. Not yet. When I thought I couldn't bear it another minute, the door opened. He carefully took me out and he put me on the shelf and I began to cool. Oh, that felt so good. Ah, this is much better, I thought. But after I cooled, he picked me up and he brushed me and he painted me all over. The fumes were horrible. I thought I would gag. Oh, please stop it. Stop it, I cried. He only shook his head and he said, not yet. Then suddenly he put me back in the oven. Only it was not like the first one. This was twice as hot, and I just knew I would suffocate. I begged, I pleaded, I screamed, I cried. I was convinced I would never make it. I was ready to give up. Just then the door opened, and he took me out and again placed me on the shelf where I cooled and waited and waited, wondering, what's he going to do to me next? An hour later... He handed me a mirror, and he said, look at yourself. And I did. I said, that's not me. That couldn't be me. It's beautiful. I'm beautiful. Quietly, he spoke. I know it hurts to be rolled and pounded and patted, but I had to, but had I just left you alone, you would have dried up. I know it made you dizzy to spin around on the wheel, but if I had stopped, you would have crumbled. I know it hurts, and it was hot and disagreeable in the oven. But if I hadn't put you there, you would have cracked. I know the fumes were bad when I brushed and painted you all over. But if I hadn't done that, you never would have hardened. You would have not had any collar in your life. If I hadn't put you back in the oven a second time, you wouldn't have survived for long because the hardness would not have held. Now you're finished, a finished product. Now you are what I had in mind when I began with you the first time. Brethren, God knows exactly what he's doing with each and every one of us in our lives. As we said, he's the potter, and we are his clay. He will mold us, and he will shape us through everything that comes with that. And he will expose us to just enough pressure. He will allow us to be exposed to just enough pressure, just enough trials, just enough troubles in our lives of the right kind. And that seems odd, but that's what he does. Just to make sure that when we're done, that you and I are flawless. That we are the piece of work, of his work, to meet his pleasure and to meet his perfect will. So through life, no matter what, let's always, always commit to enduring to the very end.